Welcome back, family. I got something very interesting for you today. Just think about this. I used to always ask people when they questioned me about the PMP exam and say, how did you get your PMP? And then I started going through the strategies and tactics. And I would more focus on the strategies because I would ask them this one question when they asked me this, what is your why? What's your reason for it? I like to remix that if you don't mind, family. I'll, and then I started asking them, how come you want to go after your P PMP? How come this is important to you? So what I did decided to do, family, since you guys showed me so much love on the terminologies and acronym, I decided to take the PMP content outline and unpack it for you in a way that you haven't seen it unpacked in a while. This is going to be unique. And also, just FYI, I am officially throwing my, as they say, my hat into the race for to be able to start training PMP as well as CAPM. So first, where you're actually part of my testing ground to see what you guys like and what you don't like. But again, this is going to be a very in-depth presentation, very high level, but it's still going to be a lot of value here if you decide to stick around with And I really think it's worth it. If, if you have a cap M, you're going after your, and you're thinking about going after your PMP, this is for you. If you don't even, if you're thinking about switching a career and you're wondering what it entails about the PMP, this is for you. Basically, if you're interested in project management, this is for you. So today um, we're going to do six and then we're going to do, a, so this is going to be part one of the 14. So we're going to do six of them today and then we're going to do another, we're going to do the remaining at another time. So we're going to see what the type of feedback you guys get me, give me. With no further ado, let's just jump into it so I can cut all the talking out. So real quick, family, the PMP exam covers three main domain areas. First one is people. Second one is process. And the last one is a uh, business environment. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you how, what this looks like. How is the percentages broken down to come to uh, basically a hundred percent. So you have people that's coming in at 42%. The, the, the importance of people is, is really emphasizes the importance of interpersonal skills and leadership in management process is really is, is 50%. And it's the largest portion of the exam. I definitely recommend getting, I, I do believe PMP, I think it's called the process book. I'm going to actually be doing some training on that too. So if you haven't got it yet and you're on the fence, I'm going to go, I'm going to do a deep dive on that for you. Cause I, like I said, I'm, I'm ready to over deliver. This reflects on the critical nature of understanding and implementing project management processes and methodologies. Business environment. The business in, um, environment, it consists of 8%. Uh, even though it's the smallest of the percentage, this domain is so crucial to understanding basically the broader context of how projects uh, actually operate. This is how it breaks down individually. So I broke it down for you so you can really see it. And again, family, I'm going to leave a link into uh, from PMI.org, which gives you the access and, and it shows you where the PMP content outline is. So I'll put that in a uh, chat or something of that nature. So that way you can go and cross reference what I'm actually doing here. So if you wanted to follow along while you're listening to today's episode, I think that'll be value. So again, people has uh, a number, has 14 tasks, process has 17, business environment has four, which gives us a grand total of 35. What we're going to be covering today is people. We're going to do six of them today, and then we'll do a part two at a later date. All right. First thing we're going to talk about is task one, manage conflict. Management, manage conflict has three items here. So it's interpret the source and stage of the conflict, analyze the context for the conflict, evaluate, recommend, and reconcile the, reconcile, excuse me, the appropriate conflict resolution solution. So this is my own interpretation, family. Again, I want you to do a deeper dive because there is definitely more context to this, but I couldn't, I, I didn't want to throw so much at you right away. I just want to ease you into this. So again, interpret the source and stage of conflict. That basically means understanding of this, this is a personal or professional issue and a resource related to the problem and understanding uh, and really trying to get to the initial stage be, uh, or has this thing already escalated that now we got to take immediate action 
and you should be taking immediate ash action even at the initial stage. Let's move on to the second piece. Analyze the context for conflict. You want to consider the project phase, the stakeholder relationship, and any potential impact on the actual project objectives. The next item, evaluate, recommend, reconcile the appropriate conflict resolution. There's different conflict resolution techniques like forcing, compromising, smoothing, withdrawing, or problem solving. Also, I want to leave a caveat here for you, family, to basically say there are much more problem conflict resolution solutions than what I'm displaying here. So I just want you to keep that in mind that there are definitely more. So you want to go and do additional homework on that, or you can wait until my course is coming out for further details. Next thing, let's talk about task two, lead a team. To lead the team in the PMP co content outline breaks down like this. It sets a clear vision and mission, support diversity and inclusion, value servant leadership, determine the appropriate leadership style, inspire, motivate, influence team members and stakeholders, analyze team members and stakeholder influence, and distinguish various options to lead various team members and stakeholders. Here we go. Let's not start unpacking this. So set a clear vision and mission. What does that look like? Set a clear vision, meaning establish a compelling vision that really aligns with the team as well as project goals and it inspires a commitment. That first one didn't say it inspires a interest. No, it inspires a commitment. That just translates meaning that we're all in. We're a, we are a team that is committing to moving forward. Then we want to uh, define the mission and defining the mission is basically articulating what is, what, why are we doing this? What is the project purpose and how does it contribute to the organ to the entire organizational strategy and the last and final one aligning team with objectives what you want to understand here is all team members understand that again that's this this is this big word this challenging word committed to the project vision as well as the mission let's move on to support diversity and inclusion you want to embrace diverse behavior types and by doing that you recognize the value of, diff of working with different personalities and working styles you don't want to get caught up in the whole, you want everybody to be like you because that doesn't bring a good diverse project. Because when you have worked with diverse people, you're able to see, they're able to see different things that you're not able to see. Number two, encourage diverse thought process. That's what I was building off of, off the first point. Foster an environment where team members feel comfortable sharing unique pro uh, perspectives as well as ideals. And then most of all, promote and inclusive practices that just basically meaning implementing a strategy that will make team members feel value and have an equal opportunity to contribute. Let's look at my favorite value servant leadership. You want to, the team comes first. I don't know how the team comes first. And the reason why I get so caught up in that is because sometimes project managers think, oh, it's about me. No project manager is about the team. Without the team, you wouldn't even be there. So I'm sorry, I just went on a rant, but focus on supporting and empowering team members to achieve their best work, fostering growth. That just basically means providing opportunities for team members to develop their skills so they can advance their, their careers. Encourage collaboration. That is my favorite thing there of collaborating. It's better to go together as a team and collaborating and working together, meaning you got my back, I got your back. So how we do that is create an environment that really promotes teamwork and shared decision-making. I'm sorry to stretch that out, but it's the true family. If you work in this thing that I love, that I hope you fall in love with called project management, you'll notice how there is not a shared decision-making. So when you're going after your PMP, you want to keep this in mind that you need, that if you want to be in an environment that is collaborative as what, and which promotes teamwork and shared decision-making. The next item is lead by example. You want to be able to distribute Distributely, or I should say, demonstrate ethical behaviors and commitment to the project and organizational values. Next task, determining appropriate leadership styles. Like I said, I covered, I'm only covering four here. There's a plethora of different leadership styles. So let's look at the first one, directive style. That's basically suitable for requiring a clear guidance and quick decision making. Often, usually you do use this with team members that do not have a, a lot of experience. So you're just very direct. You're straight to the point. Collaborative style. Now, this is where you work with people that have a, a diverse expertise and it's normally on complex projects. So most of the time when you're working on complex projects and you have a team that 
that that is full of experts. You want to keep, you want to ensure that you're encouraging teams input and a shared problem solving. Situational leadership. This is another one of my favorites. You basically adapt your leadership based on the maturity of the team and where you're at actually in the project and what type of problems and or challenges that you encounter. And then the last and final one, democratic style or what they call a participative uh, leadership. This basically means is that you encourage collaborative and a shared decision making. All right, still staying with task number two. I told you we're going to break each one of these down. Tell me where you've seen this at before, family. I'll be encouraged to know, but we're unpacking it today for you. Inspire, motivate, and influence team members and stakeholders. You want to develop team contracts. This basically means create and implement team contracts to establish clear expectations and foster commitment. There's that word. If you're noticing a theme here, family, you keep seeing the word commitment. You don't see interest. It doesn't say create and implement team contracts to establish clear expectation and foster interest. It says commitment. So keep that in mind as you're studying for, if you're already studying for the PMP exam, or like I said, thinking about going after the PMP exam. Number two, implement social contracts really, it builds team cohesiveness. It really defines a shared value and behavior. That means, hey, if we say we're going to be at a meeting on time or within five minutes of the meeting start, or we start the meeting within five minutes, that is a social contract. Design a rewards system. That means develop and implement a reward system so you can recognize high performance and team uh, teamwork. And the last and final thing, provide regular feedback. You want to be able to offer constructive feedback and recognition to your team members to keep them motivated and aligned within a pro and project goals, especially when it's a long project. It's sometimes it can get really dull and boring. So you want to be able to provide that constructive feedback and also at the same time recognize. Let's unpack analyzing team members and stakeholder influence. You want to be able to identify key influencers. You do that by recognizing team members and stakeholders with significant impact on project outcomes. Next thing, assess influence levels. You want to be able to evaluate the degree of influence each individual holds at the same time, how it impacts, or I should say affects project dynamics. Map influence networks. Create a visual representation. This means influence and relationships within the whole entire project ecosystem. And the last and final thing here, family, is leverage positive influence. Develop these strategies to harness a positive influence to support the project objectives. Now, let's look at distinguish various options to lead various team members and stakeholders. You want to tailor your communication approach. Adapt communication styles that's suited for the teams. An example of that family is if you have a team member that really likes to uh, get communication through Teams or Slack and because they rarely check their emails or they're playing catch up with emails, that's tailoring your communication. Customize motivation strategies. You want to find different motivation techniques based on individual goals and values. One of the things that I do with this area is I, you find out what motivates people. This is why I'm going to slide down to build individual relationships. You want to build, when you build individual relationships with your project team and your stakeholders, this gives you a time, this gives you an opportunity to see what motivates that particular individual. Now, moving back over, adjust leadership styles. Again, fix leadership uh, approach to effectively manage and influence various personalities and roles. And trust me, family, you will have some personalities. Let's move on to task number three, support team performance. We're going to unpack today for you appraise team member performance against uh, key performance indicators, aka KPIs, support and recognize team member growth and development, determine appropriate feedback approach, and verify performance improvement. Let's do it. First of all, appraising team members' performance against key performance indicators. When you establish key performance indicators, this is basically you want to define clear, measurable KPIs aligned with the actual project objectives and individual roles. Next item is conduct regular assessments. This means doing periodic evaluations. Let me park here parenthetically. What I mean by that is, is that when it says periodically, this does not mean waiting to the end of the year to say, here's your evaluation. This does no good to you or the actual project team member or stakeholder. So you want to make sure you perform periodic evaluation of team members 
performance against what has been established uh, as your KPIs. Again, key performance in indicators. Next thing, provide constructive feedback. This means offering specific, actionable feedback to help team members improve as well as grow. Let's go on to the next item. Recognize and reward achievement. Again, you want to acknowledge, celebrate your team, especially when they meet and definitely when they exceed the performance expectations. If you guys can see me right now, family, I'm just having a ball over here, but I digress. Let's move on to the next thing. Support and recognize team member growth and development. That means identifying development opportunities. Hey, where's the opportunity to recognize area where we can enhance the project team member's skill as well as knowledge in the project context? Create individual development plans. Work with the team members to establish personal, uh, personalized plans for skill enhancement and career growth. And then the, the third item is provide learning resources. This means offering access to training. Hey, this is an opportunity here. This is training that we're doing live here, as well as workshops and other learning opportunities to, that's relevant to project needs, as well as individual goals. The next item, encourage stretch, stretch assignments. I always say, family, when you are, watch this, uncomfortable in an uncomfortable situation, it allows you to stretch. So assigning challenging tasks that push team members to grow and develop new competencies. Let's move on to determine appropriate feedback approaches. You want to provide formal feedback. This means this is more of a structure approach to a performance review when you're documenting the assessment and typically conducted in set of intervals. You all, you know how, how we roll here. Documentation beats conversation. But sometimes you want to have an informal feedback. Maybe you want to give feedback in real time and you've seen something, you notice something, you say, oh, let me talk to that person. And I want to be honest with you, family. You want to be able, in the real world, transitioning out of PMP real quick, you want to be able to have an informal and formal feedback a lot. Because what happens is that if you wait until, until afterwards, sometimes it's not going to have the impact on the actual team member. So being able to give informal as well as formal and really creating a hybrid of that approach. But let's zoom back into the PMP. PMP is saying formal feedback, informal feedback, and then the last one, 360 degree feedback. That means a comprehensive feedback gathered from peers, from, your, from supervisors, from well-rounded perspective, from subordinates. It can go on. But the reason why I pause there is because of the fact of when you're, to me, when I look at subordinates, I really look at it more of your peer. And then I look at it as a supervisor. But when I was doing my homework and unpacking this for you guys regarding the PMP, this is something that came up. All right, let's look at verifying performance improvement. But you want to establish baseline metrics. That means defining the initial performance levels, serving as a starting point for improvement measures, measurements, implementing improvement strategies. That means uh, applying target in, in interventions as well as support to, in, uh, to enhance performance in a specific area. You want to conduct follow-up assessments. That looks like regular evaluation to track progress and identify changes in performance level. And then finally, analyze those improvement trends, meaning reviewing the data so you can uh, ensure that the performance enhancement as well as identify areas are there for further development. Let's move on to task number four, empower team members and stakeholders. We got four here. Organize around team strength, support team task accountability, evaluate demonstration of task accountability, and, and the last and final one, determine and bestow levels of decision-making authority. Let's unpack the very first one. Organize around strength. That's just basically meaning you want to identify individual strengths by assessing and documenting the skills and uh, talents each team member has. Let me zoom out real quick. A lot of times what I've seen where I've watched project managers, and I've been guilty of this until I had a mentor talk to me. A lot of times we will want to assess an individual and say, they can't do this, they can't do that. But then they, we lose sight of what they can do. So what I'm saying to you is zooming back into the content outline, we want to identify those strengths so we can empower those strengths. At the same time, parallel, we're still working on their weaknesses. So again, let's move on to the next point. Aligning, align roles with strengths. Assign tasks and responsibilities that leverage each team member's strongest abilities. Foster strength based on collaboration. One of my favorite words, 
is encourage team members to support each other by sharing their stress on very various project tasks. Last and final one, you want to develop a complementary skill. That means providing opportunities for team members to enhance skills that complement their core strengths. Let's move on to supporting team task accountability. You want to clearly define responsibility. That means ensuring team members understand what their specific tasks and deliverables are. You want to set clear expectations. And I'll say this again as so something you can remember if you're getting ready to take the PMP exam or if you, uh, or you're thinking about taking a PMP exam. A lot of times frustration comes from a lack of expectations. So when you set clear expectations from the deliverables and deadlines, this basically means set clear metrics and deadlines for task completion and quality. Next point, provide necessary resources. Do you want to equip team members with the tools and support needed to fulfill their requirements, excuse me, their responsibilities. Next item, encourage team members to take ownership of their tasks. When you give someone authority and allow them to make decisions within their area of responsibility, this improves their, their courage, this improves their confidence because now they know they have an opportunity to make a solid decision and not a choice. Foster a culture where team members feel comfortable asking for help. Family, we are there to support each other. This is why they talk about collaboration so much in the PMP content outline. So encouraging and sharing of both successes as well as challenges. Let's move on to the next item. Evaluating this uh, demonstration of task accountability. You want to establish key performance indicators. Define measurable metrics for each role or task. Again, conduct regular performance reviews. This is periodic assessment, monthly, quarterly, whatever that looks like for you. Provide constructive feedback, balance the positive reinforcement, as well as improvement suggestions. The next item, recognize and reward performance, both, both formal as well as informal recognition methods. Last and final one, address underperformance. You want to be able to meet this head on. You want to get to the root of it and you get to the root of it by identifying issue as early as possible through actually monitoring. Let's move on determining and bestowing decision-making authority. Assess team members and capability. That means evaluate the skills, experience, and judgment of each team member. Define decision boundaries. That means clearly outlining the scope and limit of decision-making authority for different roles. The, uh, delegate authority gradually. What that looks like is just basically inc incrementally increasing the decision-making power a team member demonstrates as they demonstrate competency and reliability. And at the la at the same time, you want to monitor support, and you do that by providing guidance and oversight to ensure empowered team members make an effective decision. All right, task number five. This is based off ensure team members and uh, stakeholders are adequately trained. Let's unpack these bullet points. Determine required competencies and elements of training. Next item, determine training options based on training need. Allocate resources for training and finally measure training outcomes. Here we go. Determine required competencies and training elements. I got four here. So conduct a skills gap analysis. This, looks, this basically means it's just Understanding the difference between current team competencies and those that are required for project success. Number two, define learning objectives. Establish clear, measurable goals of what team members should know or at least be able to do after training. And then prioritize training need, needs. That just basically means rank required competencies based on their importance of project outcomes and urgencies of acquisition. And the last and final one, family, is design a training curriculum. That means develop a comprehensive training plan that addresses all identified competency gaps as well as learning objectives. Determine training options based on needs. Formal training prog uh, programs, structural courses, workshops, certification programs, like the one we're talking about here, PMP, delivered by internal or external uh, experts. On the, job, on the job training, that looks like hands-on learning experience integrated into a daily project work, often involve, involving mentoring or shadowing, self-paced learning. That is like an online course, you like your Udemy's, like uh, things of that nature, uh, Skillshare. And these are just e-learning modules, also reading materials that team members can access 
and complete at their own pace. Allocating resources for training. We're going to look at budget allocation. That means determining and securing or secure the necessary funds for training activities within the bu a project budget. Time management. You want to be able to schedule training sessions to minimize disruption to the project timelines while ensuring adequate learning time. Next item, facilitate equipment. This is basically meaning that you are arranging appropriate spaces and tools needed for effective that's that word again, training delivery, human resources, identify and engage qualified trainer. I am on my way to be that or mentors to conduct the training sessions. Measuring training outcomes, pre-training uh, assessment, evaluate team member knowledge and skills before training to establish a, a baseline. After you do the pre-training, you want to do a post-training evaluation. You want to assess knowledge and skill improvement immediately after the training uh, completion. On-the-job application. Monitor how effectively team members apply new skills and knowledge in their project work. Number four, long-term impact assessment. This is basically meaning evaluate training's effect on the project performance and outcomes over time. The last and final task, family, and then we will wrap this up. Task number six is build a team. Appraise for stakeholder skills, deduce project resource requirements, continuously assess and refresh teams' skills to meet project need, and then maintain team and knowledge transfer. All right, here we go. Appraising stakeholder skills. You want to be able to do a, a conduct a stakeholder analysis. What does that mean? That's basically identifying key stakeholders and their roles as it relates or the relationship to the project. Assess technical competencies. That just basically means you want to evaluate stakeholders' expertise, which is relevant to project technical re requirements. Gauging soft skills, that's around communication, leadership, and interpersonal skills of stakeholders. The last and final thing here, family, is identify potential contribution. Determine how stakeholder skills can be leveraged to benefit the project. Next item, deducing project resource requirements. Analyze project scope. Review the project objectives, deliverables to identify necessary skills and expertise. Estimate workload. This basically translates as to determine the amount of work required for each project task or phase. Next, number three, identify skill gaps. This means compare required skills with available resources to identify areas needed additional support. And the last and final one, plan resource allocation. This is just basically a develop a strategy for acquiring uh, and assigning resources to meet project needs. Continually assessing and refreshing team skills. You want to do regular skill audits. This is just basically, again, a periodic assessment for team members and skill competencies. Next item is identify emerging need needs. Anticipate future skill requirements based on the project progression as well as changes. And then the next item is provide ongoing training, just offering continuous learning opportunities to keep, to keep team member skills current and relevant. And the last and final one here is adjust team composition. Modify the team makeup as needed to ensure the right mix of skills throughout the project life cycle. Maintaining team and knowledge transfer. This is one of my favorite. You want to create a knowledge repository. A knowledge repository is basically like a SharePoint. What's another one? A share file. I've used Box. And this is basically meaning establish a centralized system for documenting and storing project-related information and best practices. Facilitate mentoring programs. I actually mentor people myself, and I find out that it's the importance of it is being able to pair experienced team members with newer ones to promote skills and knowledge transfer. You also want to conduct regular knowledge sharing uh, sessions. This meaning just organizing a meeting or workshops where team members can share insights and lessons learned. Last and final one here, family, is implement succession planning. Prepare for potential changes by ensuring critical knowledge is not held by a single individual. Family, this is today's conclusion of the PMP outline. What I've just done for you, family, is I took the PMP outline. I unpacked it one through six. We are, and by the way, if you stayed this long, thank you for staying this long because this is a lot of information. But what I wanted to do, I wanted to do something very special for people that really are interested in the PMP. I'm actually going to do a cap M one like this if you guys really like this. And remember, 
the co- these are concepts and with it being concept, the PMP is a situational question. So the, you can't memorize this stuff. You have to understand it. You have to breathe it. You have to know it because if you don't, trying to memorize it is not going to help. So I want you to do a deeper dive. What I will do, as I did promise, I will put the actual content outline in there. So if you want to go back and listen to this episode and follow the content outline and see some of the things, how I broke it down from a very high level, as well as if you want to go deeper, because you're going to need to go deeper as you're striving towards the PMP exam, as well as, like I said, I will be doing a cap version. This is volume one for the people. And then we're also going to look at the process as well as business, depending on how you guys do. So with that being the case, family, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As usual, I enjoyed delivering it. If you haven't, pick up the Magnetic Project Manager. You can get it at uh, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon. I'll leave a link in the uh, description for that. It would mean a lot to me. I give so much back. I'm just asking you to pick up a little book of mine which I really believe will have a lot of value to you. I go by the name ED. Again, for all you smart and intelligent folks out there, that just simply means Ed. And until next time, my slogan, I'm out.